This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning... Two distinguished gentlemen this time, Charles Hugh Smith, well-recognized writer on the web and publisher of the website Up To Mind, certainly no stranger to our long-term listeners. Welcome, Charles. Welcome. Thank you very much. We also have uh, Bill Lagner with us, who is the co-founder of Bearing Asset Management. Welcome, Bill. Welcome. Uh, for our listeners who are unfamiliar with Bill's background, he is um, well-recognized in the industry as having had his fund well-positioned for the financial crisis and the housing collapse. And maybe by knowing what is on Bill's mind this morning, we can get some insight into what lies ahead. We will continue from Session 1, already in progress. Bill, uh, can we pick up where we uh, we left off uh, prior here? You were up on one of your charts. Absolutely. We're on turning Japanese. I was just going to say that, you know, whereby intervention, monetary and fiscal intervention in Japan over many, many years essentially destroyed what was left of the real economy. And you had this, uh, you had China and other uh, uh, countries coming in and trying to play this mercantilist game and, and using a very cheap currency to, to uh, create revenue. Um, China has used several of their um, of their bullets, if you will, to try and, and fight this kind of contraction. And I think that this last uh, bout of intervention here with the new regime uh, will fail miserably just because I think that the debt load is so high. Again, the debt load, I think, is, is much greater than 200 percent to GDP. They're having a difficult time rolling over local debt. And you've got asset bubbles starting to burst. Um, the, the Shanghai market, even though it's rallied over the last several months, you know, it's been going down now for a number of years. Housing is starting to leak. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, the, I think that the response mechanism this time around will fail. And I think the market is starting to smell that. You know, I saw just a, a quick comment on the money supply in China. Uh, it's gone up fivefold since 2002. And mm -hmm. that's, um, I mean, that's an, an astonishing increase uh, in, in fiat currency floating around. And uh, yes, even at, at 7 or 8% uh, GDP growth, uh, which is what they claim, and a lot of people feel it's, um, it's uh, an exaggeration if you look at um, electric uh, electricity consumption and so on. But it, it, their economy hasn't grown fivefold, so they they have they're running the same game everybody else is, which is printing um, and creating tremendous amounts of credit for a diminishing return. And I think that that may be the the the, the sort of killer uh, dynamic here in the global economy that, that we're kind of we're all talking about diminishing return on ever increasing. Uh, expansions of credit and, and money supply. So I think with that, let's go on to the next slide because I think that's exactly that's exactly where I was going with this. You know, the central banks, which in my world, the classic Keynesian response is, well, you don't want to fight the Fed. If the Fed is loose, if they're printing money, then then uh, you know they're they're going to be able to manufacture. Uh, asset inflation, they're going to be able to manufacture nominal GDP growth, and then indirectly they'll be able to collect, you know, more tax revenues, which essentially is what keeps the whole fiat system together. Well, you know, you see here that the, whether it's the European Central Bank of late, the Bank of Japan talking about expanding their balance sheet significantly again, the Fed, which is clearly expanding the balance sheet. Some trillion dollars plus is what people say, although there's been some rumor of dissension of late. And then the Bank of England, which has had several uh, expansionary um, uh, implementations here the last few years, and they're actually contemplating uh, more expansion. So I think that the one, again, fascinating part of this puzzle is their, the central bank balance sheets um I forgot to mention uh, Europe, but the central bank balance sheets of the major governments are um, 
are growing and they're basically in some cases 25, 30% of GDP. What's interesting is they're at or close to zero in terms of overnight money um, made, made available to their primary dealers. And yet they can't get nominal GDP around the world to grow as this chart here, chart 12 shows. I mean, nominal GDP is actually sliding and it's sliding everywhere. Um, even, even the places where the expansionary tax tactics have been greater than, than others. I mean, for example, the central bank of Brazil has expanded, but it, they haven't expanded the balance sheet anywhere close to what we've seen in Europe. What's really happening is you, the private sector. Uh, I know Charles has written about this on his blog. The private sector is shying away from credit. They don't want credit, uh, or they're defaulting. So private sector credit is actually in Europe, uh, in the U.S., is actually contracting. And because if the economic actors don't believe in, in taking on debt to expand their business and or launch a, launch a venture, uh, the system is essentially going in reverse. And I think that's exactly where we are. And this is one of the reasons why I think you see the same cast of characters that we saw right before 2008, um, saying, get long. You want to, you want to buy stocks. We have an economic recovery. The same cast of characters that walk people into the fire in 2008 are right back on Bloomberg and CNBC telling people to do the same thing. You protest too much, I think Shakespeare said, and that's exactly what's going on. Bill, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, this GDP chart that we have up, it's, uh, and if you really use proper, a proper deflator, and we've had many discussions on the show, we're actually in negative and we're in contraction. It's not just slowing, but we're actually contracting if you really were to spend some time on it. And where I, where, how I could prove that to you is on your comment about the, the corporations. They're sitting on two uh, trillion dollars more on cash deposits in U.S. banks in total than the banks are, are putting out in loans. They're not putting it into capital expenditures anywhere, I mean, at a rate, and so it's plummeting. And I saw some statistics the other day that shows that EBITDA of the corporations on a global basis broken out by, uh, by regions is, in fact, uh, nearing zero, which is when you look at valuations, they're based on discounted free cash flow. So if you're not generating cash on a discounted basis, even if you can take the discount rate down, which we've been doing with uh, basically with uh, with financial regression, the valuations are, are not there. And, and, and it's forcing them into a set of behavior. But it begs another question. It says that the underlying collateral values – that are so, so, and it goes to your article, Charles, that you wrote on uh, the global end, end game. If the collateral values are collapsing, and they are, and whether you want to have them adjusted properly on the books as we went through with Mark to Market, um, that begs a lot of questions because we have something called rehypothecation, where it's going to make the housing bubble and collateralized debt obligations look rather minor because we have pyramided these uh, these debt structures as collateral with unlimited uh, uh, leverage because there's no restrictions on it. That makes sense to you, Bill. Are you familiar with this? Oh, I'm very familiar with this. I I think um, you know the next slide where you see Bernanke is the Time Person of the Year. Um, of course, this was late uh, 09, early 2010. This whole idea that you know Bernanke because he was this. Uh, uh, scholar on the on the depression and he was not going to let another depression happen on his watch so they opened up the credit spigots and they made they took all of this suspect collateral this phantom collateral as as Charles uh, likes to call it uh and they essentially you know small dis small haircuts at the fed window but they loaned money to the various financial intermediaries and that essentially kept the entire um credit system from just imploding. Now, what's interesting is, uh, and this is, again, gets back to Austrian economics, when you look at kind of the initial infancy of credit fault swaps, interest rate swaps in the mid-90s, it was really started by a group of J.P. Morgan bankers in Boca Raton, Florida, that said, how do we grow credit at multiples of the economic activity and at the same time, you know, minimize interest rate risk and default risk. And this is how they 
you know, they, they essentially created these instruments. And now, of course, I know you've talked about this uh, quite a bit, Gordon. You know, the derivatives market, interest rate, credit, fault swaps are in the hundreds of trillions of dollars on a notional basis. And essentially the too big to fail entities have controlled, um, really have controlled the policymakers such that they continue to run wild. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to relever the system. And your point, Gordon, is that they're trying to relever a system, but the collateral values globally are going down. The, probably the greatest, I mean, when we saw the, how, we were early, by the way, on the housing bubble, we were probably a year to a year and a half early on housing. But then once housing values started to roll over in 2005, that was your clue that eventually this would show up in the credit markets. And they did in late 06, early 07. This time around, I think if you look at either tax revenues by the, by the westernized governments around the world, they, they can't get traction. Um, even though they've been able to temporarily reflate stocks and parts of the real estate market through ZERP, um, economic activity is top line activity, uh, peaked several quarters ago. So as top line activity, revenues of corporations and individuals as wages go down, the collateral, which is really the un- underlying economic actors and how much they can tax, um, those tax revenues are not going to go up. They're going to go down. And I think the real economy globally will continue to shrink. And I think that is, you know, the growth of government, the crowding out of the private sector. I think that's going to lead to um, problems in, in currencies, problems in the sovereign debt market. You know, for example, Greece um, or Spain, no one thought it was a problem until you woke up one day and, and the Greek bond market, you know, just was destroyed within a couple of days. Interest rate spikes and it was over. And it's the same thing um, in Spain. You know, Spain saved the day by raiding their Social Security fund last year and getting a $100 billion bailout from the EU. They bought time. But I think that um, we're at this this kind of Keynesian endgame where printing money doesn't give you that that nominal GDP thrust, the tax revenue thrust. And I think the various central planners now are they're turning on one another, which is clearly what happens at the end of a of a fraud. Yeah, they've realized, and it's no secret, the marginal utility just for printing more money isn't there and hasn't been for some time. And, you know, when we all know that, and uh, we saw in the housing, when people don't have a job and the incomes are threatening, housing plummeted, collateral value falls down. Well, it's the same on other assets. So when you have non-performing loans at the level that we have, where you have corporations that can't get natural organic growth, and the only way that they've been able to shore their earnings up has been in bottom line non-operating expenses, not investing in top line investment on revenue. And with the margin compressions, it's only a matter of time. And as I said with the EBITDA, where it's going to flow into compressed collateral and falling collateral values. I believe that's happening as we talk. I don't believe it's being reflected on the books properly, with, certainly within the banking and the banking regulators, because it's being papered over. And the only hope they have right now is, in fact, to print sufficient and accelerating rates of money, this is the theory, so that, in fact, this this malinvestment can be rolled over or refinanced to buy more time. And we're seeing that. I just about fell off my chair when I saw the article that for the case for helicopter money that was put out by um, Martin Wolf in the UK last week. Um, which is basically a mouthpiece for trial balloons called overt monetary financing, which is an outright monetization of public debt on an ongoing basis. And so we're only at the beginnings of this money printing and acceleration, uh, Bill. I'd like to uh, just interject that I think that Bill's slide um, that's titled Media and Government Role in the Empire of Lies is um, is is the other half of what, what we're discussing, which is perception management. In other words, since their actual management of the economy is failing, then what the government and um, their sort of toadies in the mainstream media, they're really engaging in a perception management campaign. Um, you know, we know the numbers are fudged and um, things are adjusted after the fact. And there's a lot of, a, a lot of uh, manipulation of, of perception. And, and in other words, they're, since they're failing in the real world, they're attempting to create um, an internal mental state of that everything's fine and, and, you know, you really should go out and borrow and spend more money. And, 
And so that if when that campaign fails, when people lose complete uh, faith in, in the government and the media, then then there's another bubble that's bursting, if you will, a, a, a bubble of, of confidence and uh, trust. So let me ask you a question, Charles. What do you think some of the potential catalysts would be? Because I completely agree with you that the media, you know, print media, television, I mean, they have all sold their souls. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. Any really good investigative journalist has gone out on, you know, her own or his own of, of late and they want no part of this. So what do you think? near term or intermediate term, what do you think some of the catalysts are? I would, I would guess, you know, and of course I've been wrong for years as the, their, their perception management has been just, um, superb, you know, that they, they've, uh, managed to catch every crisis and issue yet another promise, you know, um, mm -hmm. but I would think that, that this year, uh, perhaps as early as May or June, which typically the, is the top of the market, you know, just seasonally, that if the if the market rolls over and the economy weakens to where um, a recession is undeniable, I think there there could be uh, an initial crisis of faith that would then uh, deepen as the economy uh, deteriorated. They've been doing a behavioral economics of uh, management of perceptions and expectations and doing it brilliantly, but I fully agree with you guys. It's running its course, and what's, I believe, the bubble that will pop it. I mean, we have a very complex system. It's very fragile. Things will uh, break, and these non-performing loans and the levels that we're now seeing of the malinvestment is going to show itself, and you know, what Greenspan was very clear. He said, if I could just know when there was going to be a shift in sentiment and expectations, I could manage the economy better, and they've learned that the stock market and securities markets have been one that's kept void expectations. So even though you look around and you think that things are very bad, markets going up, so things can't be that bad. But the public has lost faith in the uh, the market. They're they're actually fleeing the market, though there's been some recent people trying to catch part of this lift. And so what happens is the market can only sustain itself. And you're seeing people like Ray Dalio screaming that, you know, get the borrow money and get him into real assets. And he's not talking about just security products, things that generate free, unencumbered, discounted cash flows, and that the securities are overpriced. So when we see that start to fall, sentiment will change. And when sentiment changes, it changes very quickly. And and, and that's and, and then you can have this fragile system where it starts to uh, cascade on itself. That'll be a very dangerous moment. Well, um, what's, inter what's interesting is that you know, I've got a slide here. If you go to slide uh, 15, I mean, there's a slide from Ben Bernanke during the outset of the, you know, the uh, subprime crisis. And, you know, he made the comment. And then subsequent to that, you had a comment from ex-Treasury uh, Secretary Paulson where, you know, they were saying it's a $50 billion subprime market. It's small. It's contained. The economy's still growing. You know, we're still creating jobs and the economy is still growing. You know, everyone go back to work. Don't question what we're doing. And of course, you know, several months later, they had to essentially take over Fannie and Freddie. And then, of course, Lehman Brothers and, and the, uh, the fires began. Also, if you go to slide 14, you could see that look at, look at the, um, the green uh, bars there are the uh, central bank expansion, right? And so the crisis, the market's melting. They respond with massive amounts of growth, essentially just trying to keep the primary dealers flush. Of course, that money not making it to the real economy. The bulk of the reserves, for example, at, at the Fed have not been loaned out. They're just sitting there on deposit because, because of the things we've discussed. And yet what's fascinating is back to this behavioral finance, this idea that interest rates are going to stay low forever. So let's go ahead and lever up and speculate in certain par parts of the risk asset realm again. So whether it's high yield bonds, um, stocks, uh, and MLPs, I mean, I can give you statistics on speculation and master limited partnerships. The reach for yield bubble today, I would say, is as pervasive and, and as distorted as the housing bubble was at the peak in 2005. Now, of course, there was that period of time where the markets finally digested enough information, and it was New Century Financial, I believe, in early 07 that couldn't essentially issue 
the mortgage-backed securities they were packaging, and that was the market calling out structured finance. I think today um, it's this it's this realization that the the economies around the world are continuing to decelerate. We're four years into this money printing exercise, and it's not working not just here but globally. And I think you're going to watch credit spreads begin to widen um, in the sovereign debt world. I think you're going to see uh, credit default swap prices go up on sovereign debt. Credit spreads start to widen. I mean, look at the amount of, of debt that both Europe and the U.S. has to roll over just this year. I mean, the numbers are staggering. Um, I'd like to ask Bill before we run out of time. Bill, what do you see um, for the the U.S. equity market in you know the rest of 2013? I mean, is there? Do you anticipate this um, you know money printing rally to continue, or you know is there a rollover point? Boy, that's I. Uh, well, we uh, we had a tough year last year. We thought that last year was was kind of the breaking point. Um, Mainly because of the um, real economy, the data coming out of the real economy, just showing that it was not getting traction. I, um, you know, you mentioned Ray Dalio and and being on the wire lately, telling people to get out of cash and get into things. Uh, at the same time, he is um, he has sold equity stakes in his money management business. Um, that's kind of a warning sign. You, so you have this 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 kind of process whereby realization by the big players that I mean, if Ray Dalio is encouraging public pension funds to borrow against bonds which are at multi-decade highs to buy more stocks, at the same time he's selling equity in his business, uh, my eyebrow goes up. I'm 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 concerned. Number two. Um, operating earnings peaked in the second quarter of, of last year. I mean, you look at just operating earnings, clean operating earnings, they peaked and revenue top line growth peaked in the second quarter of last year. So I think we're going to get, um, a prop, a continual, uh, profit recession in the United States and in Europe. I think we're going to get credit spreads widening. I think governments are going to have a tougher and tougher time keeping interest rates down because there, there's so much debt now that they've been uh, having to uh, reissue and or new issuance, i.e. deficit financing. I think the deficits will be greater across uh, China. Uh, no one talks about this. China's running a huge deficit. Europe and the U.S., I think the deficits are going to be big. And I think the governments are, are also at the same time trying to reach for more revenue, You know, whether it's here and great piece that Charles wrote about Obamacare, that's just another tax grab, and they're trying to find new revenue sources. So I think the real economy shrinks dramatically. I think we've already seen the peak in corporate profits. You know, the professional speculator, it's, it's, it's analogous to going to the Bellagio, and we're all gambling, and we all spend the uh, Federal Reserve notes that we brought into the casino, but the pit boss keeps issuing these credit lines to us, and we go from table to table to table, but we keep losing, and ultimately we do leave the casino. And I think that's exactly where we are today. I think, you know, Apple, of course, that was the hedge fund hotel of 2012. I don't know what it will be this year, but essentially fewer and fewer places to speculate. Uh, and I think these reach for yield type sectors are starting to unwind. And I think that's going to force a lot of people to leave the casino. And I think, you know, if Mark Faber was on the other day, he thinks we could see a crash. We could, but it also could be kind of a, uh, uh, a slow process where, you know, every quarter we just get more and more data that shows that things are sliding. Guys, we're up against our um, our hard line here, unfortunately, and a lot more to talk about. I think we're just touching the tip of uh, this uh, this conversation. Charles, any last question you want to ask Bill here? No, I thought that was a terrific answer, and I think there's a lot of wisdom for everybody investing uh, in that response. Bill, any closing comments you'd like to make here? Well, I would just I would tell your listeners that we are living in a very different time. Uh, we have never seen this before, and uh, and the central banks are all in. Let's let's be very frank; they have gone all in, and I think that we are going to see uh, a lot more signs that they are losing control as we meander through uh, 2013, 2014. I would be extremely defensive, and. Um, 
you know, as you know, we, we own a lot of gold and I, if gold were to go down with risk assets and some kind of a massive deleveraging, I, you know, I would tell your listeners, I think gold, uh, physical gold is, uh, not a bad place to hide. Well, could you tell our listeners how they could learn more about uh, the things that you're involved with, your fun and, uh, and your business in general? Yeah, we, um, we have a blog, uh, and we also have a private fund that we manage. Um, you can learn more about what we do and, 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 uh, look at what we've written about over the years at bearing asset, B-E-A-R-I-N-G-A-S-S-E-T dot com. Appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Great conversation, but as I said, we're always short of time. Charles, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. We'll catch you again. Thank you, guys. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.